اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ما کان محمد ابا اہدم الرجالکم ولیکن رسول اللہ و خاتم النبیین و کان اللہ بکل شیئن علیما بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شہلی صدری و اسلی امری وحل العبدت من لسانی یفکف قولی The respected people on the dais, the chairperson, Janab Haji, Muhammad Hashim Sahib, the Prince of our court, the chairman of SIT College, the honorary secretary, the respected elders, and my dear brothers and sisters. I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace, blessings, and mercy of Almighty Allah be on all of you. The topic of this evening's talk is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the various religious scriptures of the world. Many people have the misconception that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the founder of the religion of Islam. In fact, Islam is there since time immemorial. It's there since man set foot on the earth. And the Holy Quran says in Surah Fatih, chapter number 35, verse number 24, it says, وَإِمِّنْ أُمَّةٍ إِلَّا حَلَافِهَا نَذِيرٍ There is not a nation or a tribe to whom we have not sent a bone or a guide. The Quran says in Surah Rab, chapter number 13, verse number 7, and to every nation we have sent a warner. By name, the Holy Quran mentions 25 messengers by name. For example, Adam, Moses, Jesus, Solomon, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. But according to the tradition of a beloved prophet, there were more than 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. The Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 164 as well as in Surah Ghafir chapter number 40 verse number 78 that we relate to you the stories of some of the messengers of the others we don't. That means some messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have been mentioned in the Holy Quran. The others have not been mentioned. All the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of God Almighty, <coughs> that came before Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were only meant for a particular group of people. They were only sent for a particular group of people. And the message which they brought was only meant for a particular time period. It was not till eternity. The Holy Quran says <coughs> that Musa alayhi salam, Moses, peace be upon him, he was only sent for the Bani Israel, for the children of Israel. The Quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 49, that Jesus, peace be upon him, was sent as a messenger to the Bani Israel, to the children of Israel. He was only sent for the Jews. A similar message is given in the Bible, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 10, verse number 5 to 6, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, tells his disciples, his apostles, that go ye not into the way of the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? The non-Jews. Go ye not into the way of the Gentiles, and enter ye not into the city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the house of the lost sheep of Israel. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 15, verse number 24, that I have not been sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was only sent for the Jews. But the Holy Quran says, and I started my talk by quoting a verse of the Holy Quran from Surah Ahzab, chapter number 33, verse number 40, which says, Ma kana Muhammadun, ma kana Muhammadun aba ahadim mir rajalikum, walaki Rasulullah, wa khatmun nabiyin, wa kana Allahu bi kulli shayin alima. That Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the father of any of you men, but is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and is khatmun nabiyin, is the seal of the prophets, 
and Allah is all knowing, full of knowledge. The Holy Quran says that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last of the prophets and messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran says in Surah Al Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107, it says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ that we have sent thee not but as the mercy to all the creatures, as the mercy to all the worlds, as the mercy to the whole of humankind. So Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was not sent only to the Muslims or the Arabs, he was sent to the whole of humankind. The Quran says in Surah Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 28, it says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا كَحْفَةً لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَظِيرًا that we have sent thee as a universal messenger, giving glad tidings to men and warning them against sin. But the most of them yet do not understand. Since the Holy Quran says that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he was sent for the whole of humankind, all the Muslims, alhamdulillah, will agree with it. But since a non-Muslim, does not believe that the Holy Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will not agree that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a last and final prophet of God Almighty and is sent for the whole of humankind. So to make them realize this, we have to take the help of the Holy Quran, which says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, which says that, Ta'ala wila qalmitin sawa'in baynana baynakum that come to comment terms as between us and you. So since the non-Muslims will not believe in the Holy Quran, we have to prove to them about the advent of a beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, from their Holy Scriptures. So let's analyze today Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the various religious scriptures of the world. Let's first discuss the prophecy of a beloved Prophet in the Hindu scriptures. Amongst the Hindu scriptures, the most sacred are the Vedas. There are principally four Vedas. The Rig Ved, the Ajur Ved, the Sam Ved and the Tharva Ved. The first three, the Rig Ved, the Ajur Ved, the Sam Ved are known as the Triple Vidya, the Triple Sciences. And they were revealed much earlier as compared to the last Ved, that is Atharva Ved. The Rig Ved, it deals with songs of praises. The Ajur Ved, it deals with sacrifices formulas. The Sam Ved deals with melody. And the Atharva Ved deals with remedies and magic formulas. These Veds, according to the Hindus, they are the word of God Almighty. But they do not know exactly when were they revealed or when were they written. But most of the scholars unanimously say it was written about 4,000 years ago. The other important holy scripture of the Vedas are the Puranas. <coughs> the Puranas speak about the history of the universe, the history of the Aryans, the stories of gods and deities. And these Puranas have been divided into 18 voluminous parts by Maharishi Vyas. And one among them is the Bhavishya Purana. The Purana speaking about Bhavishya, about the future. If you read the Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khand 3, Adhyatta 3, Shlokas 5 to 8, it says that a Malachya, a spiritual teacher, will arise with his companions. His name shall be Muhammad, peace be upon him. And Raja Bhoj, after giving this Mahadev Arab a bath in the Panchgarh and the Ganges water, he will address him with reverence and say, O pride of humankind, I pay obeisance to you. You have collected a great force against the devil and you have been protected from the enemies. 
if you analyze this prophecy in the Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khanda 3, Adhyatta 3, Shlokas 5 to 8, it speaks about a Malaycha. A Malaycha in Sanskrit means a foreigner speaking a foreign tongue. It says, a foreigner speaking a foreign tongue. A spiritual leader will arise with his companion, that is the Sahabas, and his name shall be Muhammad, peace be upon him. And Raja Bhoj, after giving this Mahadev Arab a bath in the Panchgarav, that means it's an idiom saying that the person has been purified from all sins. And we know that all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are purified. They are masoons, they are sinless. It further says that he will address him as the pride of humankind. And we know that the beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the pride of humankind. It's mentioned in Surah Al Qalam, chapter number 68, verse number 4, that thou standest on the exalted standard of character. The Quran says in Surah Al Hazab, chapter number 33, verse number 21, that you will find in the Messenger of Allah a beautiful pattern of conduct. And the Quran says in Surah Al Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107, Wama illa We have sent thee not but as a mercy to the whole of humankind. If you read further in the Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khanda 3, Adhyatta 3, Shlokas 10 to 27. It says that the Malaychas have spoiled the land of the Arabs. Arya Dharm is not to be found there. There was a devil who God Almighty had destroyed earlier. But now he has been sent by a more powerful enemy. There will be a person who will be sent, who will correct the devil and put the enemies on the true path. His name shall be Muhammad, peace be upon him. And the prophecy continues <coughs> that says to Raja Bhoj that you need not go to the foolish land of the Pishachas for I through my kindness will purify you here itself. And a shrewd man in the form of Pishacha says that Arya Dharm will prevail in the world. Ishwar Paramatma has sent me and said that his follower will be a man who is circumcised, who will not have a tail on his head, will not have a shindi, he will sport a beard, he will create a revolution in the world, he will give the call for prayers, he will eat all lawful things, he will eat the animals but will not eat swine, he shall not be purified by the holy shrubs, that the vegetable, but will be purified by the sword. And because he will fight the irreligious people, he will be called as a Musalman. And God Almighty will start this creed of meat eaters. If you analyze this prophecy, it speaks about a devil who God Almighty had destroyed earlier. Similar to the incident mentioned in the Holy Quran in Surah Fil. In chapter number 105 it says, Alam tara kaifa fa'ala rabbuka biya sahabi al-feel. Alam yaj'al qaidahum fi tadlil. Wa arsala alayhim khoyran ababeel. Farmihim tihjaratim min sijjil. Faj'alahum kaasfim ma'kool. That fear thou not. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealt with the companions of the elephant. And let their treacherous plan go astray. And he sent against them flights of birds. Striking them with stones of baked clay and they were made to look like an empty field of straws and stalks of whose corn had been eaten away. The Prophet says there was a devil with the Quran speaks about Abraha and the army of elephants who God Almighty had destroyed. This devil was destroyed but now he has been sent by a more powerful enemy and he will be put on the true part by a person called as Muhammad. Peace be upon him. And the prophecy continues that Raja Bhoj need not go to the foolish land of the Pishachas because when the Muslims will come to India, they will be purified by the kindness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the prophecy continues that Ishwar Paramatma says that God Almighty 
that my follower will be a man who is circumcised, who is not having a tail on the head, that is a shindi, will be keeping a beard, will create a revolution in the world, and he will give the call for prayers, that is the Adan. And the prophecy continues, he will eat all lawful things, but will not have the flesh of swine. And the Holy Quran says in no less than four different places. In Surah Al-Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 173. In Surah Maida chapter number 5 verse number 3. In Surah Anam chapter number 6 verse number 145. And Surah Nahal chapter number 16 verse number 115. It says, That is forbidden for you for food. Ah, dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine and any food on which any name besides Allah has been invoked. The Quran says the flesh of swine is prohibited and the prophecy says the same that these followers will not eat the flesh of swine. They will not be purified by the herbs that the vegetable but by warfare. And because they will fight the irreligious people they will be called as Musalman. This prophecy refers to no one but a beloved prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. There are even prophecies given in the Vedas, especially in the Atharva Ved. There are certain chapters in the Atharva Ved known as the Kuntap Sukhtas. The word Kuntap means free from trouble and misery. That means a message of peace. If you translate into Arabic, it means Islam. Kuntap also means the hidden glands in the abdomen, meaning that these verses of Atharva Ved have a hidden meaning which they will come to know in the future. And Kuntap also means, that means the navel of the earth, the center of the earth. And the holy city of Makkah is referred to as Ummul Qarah, the mother of all cities, as the center of the earth. So if you read the Kuntap Suktas, that is Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 127, Verses 1 to 14, these are the Kuntap Suktas. Time does not permit us to go into the details of all the verses. I will pay emphasis to the first four verses. The first mantra says that he is Narashansa, he is Kaurama, and will be protected from 60,090 enemies. Mantra number two says he will be a camel riding Rishi. Mantra three says that. He is Mahma Rishi, who has been given a hundred gold coins, ten necklaces, three hundred steeds of horses, and ten thousand cows. Mantra 4 says, his Vachyavish rave. If you analyze these mantras, the first mantra says, he is Narashansa. Narashansa in Sanskrit, if you translate into English, means the praiseworthy. If you translate into Arabic, it means Muhammad, peace be upon him, which was the name of a beloved prophet. It also says he is Kaurama. Kaurama means a person who is an immigrant and a beloved prophet. Muhammad, peace be upon him, was an immigrant. He migrated from Makkah to Medina. And further says that he will be protected from 60,090 enemies. This was the approximate population of Makkah that was against our beloved Prophet. Mantra number two says that he will be a camel riding Rishi. No Brahmin, no Indian Rishi will ride the camel because according to the Manu Smriti, chapter number 11, verse number 202, it clearly states that a Brahmin is prohibited from riding a camel or an ass and he cannot bathe naked. He will have to suppress his bed to be purified. So, but natural, this Rishi, which the Puntap Sukta, Atharva Ved, speak about, has to be a foreigner. Mantra number three says, he is Mahma Rishi. Mahma, if you translate into English, means exalted. And some of the, trans some of the Hindu scriptures also say, he is Muhammad Rishi. Peace be upon him. It further says, he has been given 100 gold coins. These 100 gold coins refer to the first 100 Sahabas 
of the beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, who accepted Islam and later migrated to Abyssinia and joined the Prophet in Medina. He has been given ten necklaces. These ten necklaces refer to the ten people who had been promised paradise by the Prophet. It further says, he has been given 300 steeds. The Sanskrit word Arwa means an Arab horse which is very swift, an Arab steed. These 300 people, steeds, refer to the 300 companions of the Prophet who took part in the battle of Badr, who even though the enemy were thrice the number, yet they were victorious. It further says that he has been given 10,000 cows. The Sanskrit word go means cow. It also means victory. Cow is a symbol for victory and for peace. Referring to the approximate 10,000 population that was along with the Prophet during Fateh Mecca, conquest of Mecca. Mantra 4 says he is rave. Rave, if you translate into English, means one who praises, one who prays. If you translate into Arabic, it means Ahmad, which was another name of a beloved Prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him. So these Kuntab Suktas refer to no other personality than our beloved Prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him. There are several prophecies in the Hindu scriptures. If you read the Tharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 21, verse number 6, it speaks about the battle of the Ali's, the battle of Ahzab, and gives the description of the battle of Ahzab. The next verse of Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 21, verse number 7 says that, O God Almighty, you have overthrown the 20 kings and the 60,090 opponents of the praying one. The Sanskrit word karu means the praying one. If you translate into Arabic, it means Ahmad. That is the name of the beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It says that God Almighty has overthrown 20 kings. At the time of the Prophet, the Mecca had several, there were several tribes, and each tribe had their own chief. And there were approximately 20 tribes during the time of the beloved Prophet, referring to the 20 kings which were overthrown. And again, the 60,090 enemies mentioned in the Tharva Ved refers to the population of Makkah that was against our beloved Prophet. The same prophecy is also mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 1, chapter number 53, verse number 9. But the Sanskrit word used is Fushrama, which if you translate means the praiseworthy. If you translate into Arabic, means Muhammad peace be upon him, which was the name of the beloved Prophet. Again in Psalm Ved, in the Psalm Ved, again the prophecy is given in book number 2, chapter number 6, verse number 8, that Ahmad will be given the divine eternal law, may peace be upon him. But natural, Ahmad is the name of the beloved Prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him, who was given the Holy Quran, to whom was revealed the Holy Quran. There are several verses in the Hindu scriptures, but time does not permit us to deal with all the various prophecies of our beloved prophet in the Hindu scriptures. Now let's discuss the prophecy of our beloved prophet in the Parsi scriptures. Prophet Zoroaster is the prophet of the religion of Zoroastrianism or Parsiism, also known as the fire worshippers or Maganism. This religion originated about two and a half thousand years ago in Persia. And they have got two holy scriptures, the Dasatir and the Avesta. The Dasatir is further divided into Khurda Dasatir and Kalan Dasatir. The Avesta is further divided into Khurda Avesta and Kalan Avesta, or Zen Avesta or Maha Zen. These holy scriptures of the Parsi have been written in Pahalvi and Zendi, and a few of them in the cuneiform language. There are several prophecies even in the Parsi scriptures about the advent of the beloved prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. <coughs> if you read the Zend Avesta, chapter number 28, 
verse number 129, which is also mentioned in the sacred books of the East, <coughs> volume number 23, Zen Avesta part number 2, page number 220, it says that he is victorious. He is Soshian. His name is Astavet Areta. The Soshian, the beneficent one, will benefit the whole of humankind. The Astavet Areta, being a bodily creature, will fight against the evil of the humankind and will fight against the drug of the two-footed brood. If you analyze this prophecy, it says that he is victorious. And we know our beloved prophet was victorious during Fateh Mecca. It says he is Socian. Socian, according to the history in the encyclopedia, <coughs> it means praiseworthy, which we translate into Arabic means Muhammad, peace be upon him. It further says his name will be Astavit Areta. Astavit Areta has been derived from the Sanskrit word Astu meaning one who prays, one who praises, or by Sita down, the Persian word, which means the praying one, which we translate into Arabic, means Ahmad, which was another name of a beloved prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him. It further says that he will benefit the whole of humankind. And Quran says in Surah Al-Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ that we have sent thee not but as a mercy to the whole of humankind. The prophecy further says that he will be Asta with Areta who will fight against the evil of the humankind and will fight against the drug of the two-footed brood. And we know that our beloved prophet Muhammad peace be upon him fought against the evil of the humankind. If you further read in the Zed Avesta, Zamyad Yasht, chapter number 16, verse number 95, also mentioned in the sacred books of the East, volume 23, Zen Avesta part 2, page number 308, it says that his friends, the friends of Astavit Areta, they will be against the devil. They will be well thinking, well hearing, well seeing and will have good moral values and not a single falsehood had been uttered from these companions. This verse of Zend Avesta again speaks about the beloved prophet calling him as Astavet Areta, the praising one. Translated to Arabic means Ahmad, peace be upon him. And it speaks about his companions, the Sahabas, which says that they will fight against the evil. They will be well thinking, well seeing, well hearing, well behaving, will have good moral values and they will not utter a single falsehood. There are even prophecies in the Dasati, that the Parsi scriptures, about the advent of a beloved prophet. It says that when the Zoroastrians, the followers of Zoroaster, then they go away from the teaching of the Prophet and will become dissolute. There will be a person who will arise along with his companions who will subjugate the Persians, who will defeat the arrogant Persians. And these followers, they will not worship the fire but will face towards the Kaaba, the house of Abraham, peace be upon him, which will be free from all the idols. And these people will be a mercy to the whole of humankind. They will rule the land, the sacred land of the Parsis, that is Persia, Bas and Tarkan. And this man will be eloquent and generous. This prophecy fits to no one but our beloved prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and speaks about the Sahabas who stopped the fire worship and prayed towards the house of Ibrahim alayhi salam while they offered the prayers. If you further read in the Bandai Shiyash chapter number 60 verse number 6 to 27 it says that Soshian will be the last prophet. That means the praiseworthy Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him will be the last prophet 
which is the same thing mentioned in Surah Ahazab, chapter number 33, verse number 40, which says, Khatmun Nabi'een, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the seal of the Prophets. Let's analyze the prophecy of the beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the Buddhist scriptures. If you read the Buddhist scriptures, that is Takkawati Sinnat Sultana, D1176, it gives the prophecy of a Maitri. And this prophecy is repeated in most of the sacred scriptures of the Buddhists. It says that there will be coming a Buddha by the name of Maitri, who will be a holy one, a supreme one, the enlightened one, endowed with knowledge, will have wisdom, will be auspicious, will have knowledge of the universe, will receive eternal law, supreme knowledge. He will preach a religion which will be glorious at the beginning, at the climax and at the goal. He will preach the religion of truth same as the Buddha. But this Maitri will have thousands of followers while Buddha has only hundreds. This prophecy is further repeated in the sacred books of the East that this Buddha who will come by the name of Maitri, he will have thousands of followers while present Buddha has only hundreds. It's also repeated in the Gospel of Buddha by Taris, page number 217 and 218. Now if you analyze the word Maitri, it means a beneficent one, a merciful one, a person who's kind, who's loving, who's merciful. And one Arabic equivalent word for Maitri is Rahmat and our beloved Prophet. The Holy Quran mentions in Surah Al Anbiya, chapter 21, verse number 107. Wama ka illa rahmat lil alameen, that we have sent thee not but as a mercy to the whole of humankind. And every chapter of the Holy Quran, except for Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, begins with a beautiful formula. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in the name of Allah most gracious, most merciful. And the word mercy is mentioned in the Holy Quran no less than 409 times. So this Maitri which the prophecy speaks about refers to no one but our beloved prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Further if you read in the Buddhist scriptures in Mahapari Nibbana chapter number 2 Verse number 32, which is also mentioned in the sacred books of the East, volume number 11, page number 36, it says that the Buddha will not differentiate his teachings between exoteric and esoteric. The Buddha should speak the truth and should not have, his knowledge should not be like a closed fist of the teacher. That means whatever he teaches, should not be something which is partly open and partly closed. And we know our beloved Prophet spoke about the Holy Quran in public. And even today the Holy Quran is recited in public. And he said that none of the Muslims should hide the teaching of the Holy Quran from the other human beings. If you further read in Mahapari Nibbana, Sultana, chapter number 5, verse number 36, in the sacred books of the East, volume number 11, page number 97, it says that as the Buddha had a servitor by the name of Ananda, so will the Buddha Maitri to come will also have a servitor. And the servitor of the beloved Prophet was Anas, may Allah be pleased with him, who was given by his parents, his mother and father, to the Holy Prophet at the age of eight. And the Prophet called him as his beloved son or the beloved little one. And Anas, may Allah be pleased with him, he stayed by the Prophet at the time of war and peace. Even in good times as well as bad times, till the end of his life. And even during the battle of Uhud, even at the age of 11, he stood by the Prophet and protected the Prophet, when he was surrounded by the enemy. Even in battle of Hunayn, when the archers fired at the Prophet, he was there to protect the Prophet. You can very well compare him to Ananda, who even when the mad elephant rushed at Buddha, Ananda stood by Buddha. 
Further, if you read the Gospel of Buddha, by Karras, page number 214, it gives six criteria for the Maitri. And all these six criteria fit perfectly to our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It says that he will receive enlightenment at night. When he receives enlightenment, he will be lit up. He will die a natural death. He will die at night time. And we know how the Daisha, may Allah be pleased with the said that when the Prophet was dying, there was no oil in the lamp and she borrowed oil from the neighbor, indicating that the Prophet died during night time. Point number five says that when the Maitri will die, he will again be lit up, he will become bright. And last is, once he dies in the physical form, he will never appear in the physical form in this world, which refers to no one but a beloved Prophet. There are several prophecies before the read in the, in the Dhamma Padda, Sacred Books of the East, Volume 10, page number 67, it says that the Tattaghratas, that means the Buddhas, they are only preachers. And the Holy Quran says in Surah Gashya, chapter 88, verse number 21, it says, Fazakkir innama anta muzakkir. For your job is to deliver the message. The job of the messenger was only to deliver the message. His job was not to convert the people. Same Dhamma Padda, Sacred Books of the East, volume number 10, page number 67 says that the criteria for attaining salvation is righteousness, which is similar to as mentioned the Holy Quran in Surah Al Athar, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, we say, Wal As. Inna al insana la fikhus. Illa ladina amanu wa amanu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabr. That by the token of time, man is verily in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deeds, those who exhort people to truth, that is to dawa, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. These are the minimum four criteria for a person to enter Jannah according to the Holy Quran, and one of them is righteousness. Let's discuss the prophecies of a beloved prophet in the Jewish and the Christian scriptures. Before we discuss that, I would like to relate to you an incident which took place between Reverend Paul Fender and Maulana Rahmatullah Karanvi before we got independence Reverend Paul Fender asked Maulana Rahmatullah Karanvi to have a debate the Maulana said that I don't know English I only know Urdu so after a few months Paul Fender he learned Urdu and said okay now I know Urdu let's have a debate in Urdu so during the debate, Paul Fender said that why don't you start? So Maulana Sahib said, since you are our guest, you should start first. So Reverend Paul, he said that, is your Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is he dead or alive? So Maulana Sahib said that spiritually he's alive, he's Hayatul Nabi, but physically he's dead, he's buried in Medina. The next question the Reverend asked that where is your Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him now? So the Mawlana thought for a while and said that he is next to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Janat Firdaus. The Reverend asked the next question. Where was your Prophet during the battle of Karbala? So the Mawlana gave the same reply with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Janat Firdaus. So Maulana asked the next question. Where was he when his grandsons, Hussein and Hassan, may Allah be pleased with them, when they were being martyred in Karbala? Where was the Prophet? So Maulana paused for a while and then said that he was with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Janat Firdaus. So the Reverend asked the next question. When your Prophet was with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with God Almighty, when his grandsons were being killed, why didn't he request, why didn't he tell God Almighty to save his grandsons? So there was a long pause. Maulana Sahib was silent. And the Muslim audience thought, Maulana Sahib gay. Now he's gone. What did he answer? There was a long pause. So the Reverend said, Maulana Sahib, why don't you answer? Why didn't your Prophet tell God Almighty to save his grandsons? When he was with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after a long pause, the Maulana said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cried 
The Reverend said, what? Allah cried. He said, yes. Allah said, when I could not save my own son from the cross, how will I save your grandsons? This is battle of wits. The Holy Quran says, speak with hikmah. It is invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. This is a battle of wits. When someone corners you, you should use your hikmah. Though this is not the right answer, but he used his hikmah to turn the tables over. So let's discuss the prophecy of a beloved prophet in the Jewish and the Christian scriptures. The Holy Bible is divided into two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament deals with the stories of all the prophets that came before Jesus, peace be upon him. And the New Testament deals with the life of the messenger, Jesus, peace be upon him. If you read the Holy Bible of the Catholics, the dual version, it has got 73 books. If you read the other edition, Good News Bible, it has 81 books. But the main dual version has got 73 books. The Bible of the Protestants has only 66 books. They say that seven books from the Old Testament, they are apocryphal. They are apocryphi. The masses of the people don't understand the meaning of apocryphi. It means doubtful. So therefore the Protestant Christians, they don't believe in, in these six books. So the Old Testament of the Catholics contains 46 books. The Old Testament of the Protestants, it contains 39 books. The New Testaments of both contain 27 books. The Holy Quran says in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 157, that the Jews and Christians, they follow a messenger. The unlettered prophet, which is mentioned in the law and the gospel. So if you read the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18, it says, <clears throat> God Almighty says, that I shall raise thee up a prophet from among thy brethren, like unto thee, and I shall put my words into his mouth, and he shall speak all that I command him. If you ask the Christian that who does this prophecy refer to, he will say it refers to Jesus, peace be upon him. And to make it fit Jesus, peace be upon him, he will say that see, since Moses, peace be upon him, was a prophet, even Jesus, peace be upon him, was a prophet. Since Moses, peace be upon him, was a Jew, even Jesus, peace be upon him, was a Jew. So this prophecy fits to no one but Jesus, peace be upon him. The prophecy says he should be like Moses. If these two are the only criteria that the person should be a prophet and should be a Jew, then all the prophets mentioned in the Bible after Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, like Solomon, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, John the Baptist, may peace be upon them all, all these prophets fulfill the prophecy because all were Jewish and all of them were prophets of God Almighty. In fact, if you analyze, this prophecy fits to no one better than our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Because Moses, peace be upon him, and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, both of them, they had mother and father. Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, was born miraculously, without any male intervention. He only had a mother, he had no father. So Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is more like Moses, peace be upon him. And Jesus, peace be upon him, is unlike Moses, peace be upon him. Both Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them, they were married and had children. According to the Bible, Jesus, peace be upon him, was not married, neither did he have any children. Both Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them, they died a natural death. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, according to the Holy Quran, he was raised up alive. According to the false reading of the Bible, they say he was crucified on the cross. Anyway, he did not die a natural death. Both Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them, they bought new laws. Jesus, peace be upon him, bought no new law. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 17, that think not I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. I have come not to destroy, but to fulfill. 
So according to the Bible, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says that he brought no new law. Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them both, besides being prophets of God Almighty, they were even worldly kings. Worldly kings mean if they wanted, they could give any other human being the punishment of death. They were worldly kings. This was not the case with Jesus, peace be upon him. Both Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them, they were accepted by the people as a whole later on. But Jesus, peace be upon him, it's mentioned in the Gospel that in the Gospel of John, he approached his own and his own forsook him. That means his own did not accept him. So if you analyze, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is more like Moses, peace be upon him. And Jesus, peace be upon him, is unlike Moses, peace be upon him. This prophecy fits to no one but our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And further says that I shall put my words into his mouth and he shall speak all that I command him. And we know that the Holy Quran was a revelation given to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, through Archangel Gabriel. And whatever was revealed to him, he repeated it verbatim, as though words were put in his mouth. And the next verse of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, Verse number 19 says that if anyone does not hearken unto my words, I shall require it of him. One particular version says, I shall take revenge. That means any person who believes in the Bible, who does not hearken unto the words of this prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take revenge from him. It further mentioned the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29 verse number 12, that when the book will be given to the Prophet and when he will be asked to read, he will say that I am not learned. And we know that when the first revelation came to our beloved Prophet, when Archangel Gabriel said, Ikra, our beloved Prophet replied, Ma anabekare, Ma anabekari, which means I am not learned. This prophecy again fits to no one but our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Even the name of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is mentioned by name in the Holy Bible, in the Old Testament. It's mentioned in the book of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 16. The Hebrew quotation is, Hikko mamitakim vikulli muhammadim zahdudi wa zahrai baina Jerusalem. It's a Hebrew quotation, which says, Hikko mamitakim the word Muhammad, to it is added M, because in the Hebrew language, if you give respect to anyone, M is added. Like how you have Elo for God, you say Elohim. It's a respect. Same to the word Muhammad is added M, Muhammadim, peace be upon him. So, in the original Hebrew text of the Old Testament, Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 16, our beloved prophet is mentioned by name. But the translation says that he is most sweet, he is altogether lovely. The Hebrew word Muhammadim has been translated into altogether lovely. He is most sweet, he is altogether lovely. He is my friend, he is my beloved, O daughters of Jerusalem. But in the original text, the word Muhammadim is there. Let's discuss the prophecies in the Christian scriptures. All the prophecies that are mentioned in the Old Testament of the Bible are also to be followed by the Christians. In addition to the Old Testament, they also believe in the New Testament. The Holy Quran says in Surah Taf, chapter number 61, verse number 5, that Jesus, peace be upon him, the son of Mary, was sent as a messenger to the children of Israel, to the Bani Israel, confirming the law that came before them and giving glad tidings of a prophet to come, whose name shall be Ahmad, peace be upon him. The Holy Quran says in Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 6, that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Prophet Ahmad, peace be upon him, will be prophesied in the scriptures of the Christians. Besides he being mentioned in the Old Testament, he is also prophesied in the New Testament. It's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 16, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says that I shall pray to my Father, to God Almighty, to send you another Comforter who will abide with you forever. 
the Gospel of John, chapter number 15, verse number 26 says that when this Comforter will come to you, who will be sent by my Father, he will glorify me, he will testify me. It's further mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 7, that nevertheless I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter shall not come. For if I depart, shall I send him. Now if you analyze in the Greek, original Greek manuscript that you have, the word used is Paracletus. It's actually a corrupted form of the original word Perikletos, which if you translate means the praiseworthy or the praising one. If you translate to Arabic, means Muhammad or Ahmad, peace be upon him. So in the original manuscript, in the original Greek, Perikletos means Ahmad or Muhammad, peace be upon him. Even if you agree that it is not Perikletos, it's Perikletos, the exact translation is not comforter, it means an advocate or a friend. But irrespective of the Christians, whether they say it's Perikletos or Perikletos, whether it is praiseworthy or praising one or the kind one or comforter or advocate, Alhamdulillah, all these meanings fit our beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. The Christian may say that this comforter which the Bible refers to is the Holy Spirit. It does not refer to Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. So you have to remind them. The prophecy says in the Gospel of John chapter number 16 verse number 7 that nevertheless I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away the comforter shall not come. For if I depart, shall I send him? That means the criteria for the comforter to come is that Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, should go away. And the Holy Spirit which the Christians speak about was already there before Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, came. It was there in the womb of Elizabeth. It was there when Jesus Christ was being baptized, peace be upon him. So surely it cannot refer to the Holy Spirit and it only refers to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. There are several prophecies. It further mentions the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14, that I have yet many things to say unto you. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says that I have yet many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. For he, when the Spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truths. He shall tell you things to come. He shall glorify me. This spirit of truth which the Holy Bible speaks about is no one but a beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. The prophecy of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is very clearly given even in the New Testament. <clears throat> and the Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Hakaf, chapter number 46, verse number 10, that tell to the people that see you not that this is a book from God Almighty, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you reject it. Even after a witness from amongst you, from amongst the Ahl Kitab, testifies to its similarity with the early scriptures, he was a believer. But you are arrogant, and Allah guides not the unjust people. The prophecy, the Holy Quran says that. Don't you see that this is a book from God Almighty, the Holy Quran, and you non-Muslim reject it, whether it be the Hindus, whether it be the Parsis, whether it be the Buddhists, whether it be the Jews, whether it be the Christians, it says, this book is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and a witness from amongst you has already testified to its similarities about the prophet or beloved prophet, and you reject it. The witness from amongst you was a believer. And you are arrogant people. You are unjust. And Allah guides not the unjust people. I would like to end my talk by quoting a verse of the Holy Quran from Surah Al Kawsar, chapter number 108, verse number 1 to 3, which says, Inna a'tayna kal kawsar, li li rabbika wanhar, inna sha'anya kawal abtar, which means that we have granted thee, that is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the fount of abundance, Jannah the fount of abundance. 
so turn to thy Lord in prayer and sacrifice. And anyone who hated thee, that is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he will be cut off from all future hope. Wa akhirul da'wan, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We are really lucky, alhamdulillah, that our Dr. Zakir Karim Sahib is here in Madras. But since the question and answer session is there, I would like to just put forth before him the questions have been asked to me by non-Muslims very often, but I am still not able to answer to them in a correct perspective manner. Dr. Saab, it is our firm belief that the believers will go to Jannah and the non-believers will go to hell. But a Hindu or a Christian often asks me that we are born in a Hindu family or we are born in a Christian family and naturally we will continue to have to follow the same religion. It is not our fault whether we will also go to hell forever or shall we also go to heaven. And second question I used to tell them, you are supposed to read the Holy Quran and understand the religion. But another firm belief is, even a Muslim we should not supposed to touch the Quran without wazu. We have to be wazu and then only we must read Quran. But how can a non-believer who is not a Muslim, when Muslims, we ourselves cannot touch the Quran, how can a non-believer can touch the Quran and read? That is a question I am not able to answer. Could you please answer this? Thank you. The learned brother has asked two questions. The first one is that the non-Muslims say that according to Islam, only the believers, only the Muslims will go to Jannah. How are we to blame that as a Hindu and a Christian, if he is born in a Hindu family, a Christian family, we should blame God Almighty. Because God Almighty put us in a Christian family and a Hindu family. So how, according to Islam, isn't your Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unjust that because we are born in a non-Muslim family, you will be put to hell? The answer that you can give is that according to our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, every child is born in Deen al fit Deen al fit means the innate religion. Every child is born as a Muslim, irrespective whether he is born in a Hindu family, a Muslim family, a Christian family, a Parsi family or a Buddhist family. Every child is born as a Muslim. What is the meaning of the word Muslim? Muslim means one who submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Later on, by the influence of his elders, the influence of his parents, influence of a teacher, our beloved prophet said, he starts doing idol worship, he starts worshipping fire, and he goes away from Sirat al-Mustaqim and goes on the wrong track. Therefore, when a non-Muslim accepts Islam, we prefer using the word revert than the English word convert. Convert means going from one track to the other track. Revert means every human being initially is a Muslim. By the influence of other people, he goes on the wrong track. And later on, he is reverted back to the correct Sirat al-Mustaqim, that is Islam. So therefore, revert is a more appropriate word for a non-Muslim who becomes a Muslim than the English word convert. So every child is born in Deen al -Fit. If you ask, what proof do you have today? There was a research done on two tribes, the Kapauku tribe and the tribe of Australian aborigines. These two tribes did not come in contact with modern civilization till as late as 1950. When the researchers went and tried to find out the way of life, they were following Islam in everything except in name. They believed there was one God, they believed he was almighty, he was omnipresent, he was omnipotent, he did not beget, nor was he begotten. They did the sujood when they prayed to this God Almighty. They were following Islam, everything but in name. They didn't call themselves Muslims. But indeed, they were Muslims. So if we do an experiment today, that if you take a child from a Hindu family, one from a Christian family, one from a Buddhist family, the moment the child is born, isolate him from the other human beings. Let him come up absolutely without in contact with any other human being. Isolate him and let him grow up. See to it he gets food but does not come in contact with any other human being. After he grows up, if you try and learn his philosophy, it will be everything of Islam but in name. Because this is the innate religion. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in every human being the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the religion of Islam. And Quran says in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 172 and 173, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before the human beings came in this world, He bought the children of Adam from the loins and He asked all the human beings before they came in this world, they were asked, the souls were asked, that do you believe there is one God and all of them testified yes we believe there is only one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala later on the memory was washed and they have come into this world it is their duty to find the truth but even if they don't find the truth Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes it upon himself to deliver the message of Islam it is the duty of Muslim to dawah but in spite of that Allah says in Surah Fusilat chapter number 41 verse number 53 he says sanurihim ayatina fil afakhi that soon we shall show them our signs in the furthest region of the horizon and into their soul until it is clear to them that this is the truth. Allah takes it up upon Himself that in every individual soul, besides showing His signs in the horizon, the sun, the moon, the trees, etc., He will even make it clear into their soul that this is the truth. But later on, after accepting the truth, many people, they agree with it, but they don't accept it, because if they accept it, if they become Muslims, they may go lost in business. They may lose their friends. So for material gain, they do not accept the truth. They agree with it, but they don't accept it. And Allah says very clearly, that by the age of 40, every human being will agree that there is one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least once in the lifetime. So, the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is given to every human being and every human being is born as a Muslim later on he goes to the wrong track regarding that will Muslims go to Jannah only by saying La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah you do not get a ticket to heaven there are many Muslims who feel that only by saying the Shahada you go to Jannah the criteria for going to Jannah is mentioned as I said in my talk in Surah Al-Asr chapter number 103 verse number 1 to 3 we says Wal Asr إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَآمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاسَوْا بِالْحَكِّ وَتَوَاسَوْا بِالْصَبْرِ That by the token of time, man is very in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deed, those who exhort people to patience and perseverance, those who exhort people to truth, that is to dawah and islah. These are the minimum four criteria for a person to go to Jannah. If any one of these four criteria is missing, According to Surah Al-Asr, you shall not enter Jannah. You may be a good Muslim, you may have Iman, you may be offering the Salah, you may have gone for Hajj, but if you don't do Dawah, if you don't deliver the message, you shall not enter Jannah. All four criteria are required for a person to enter Jannah. Not only saying the Shahada. The person should have belief, should have righteous deed, that it should be honest, etc. Should invite people to truth, do Dawah, and invite people to patience and perseverance. Only being born in a Muslim family will not transport you to Jannah. Hope this answers the first question. Regarding the second question, that Muslims are supposed to do wudu and touch the Quran, how will the non-Muslim read the Quran? And normally, I will be dealing with this topic in detail tomorrow, inshallah, in the morning. Al-Quran, should it be read with understanding, I will be dealing with the subject in detail. But just to answer briefly, what the Muslims refer to the verse in the Holy Quran from Surah Waqiyah, chapter number 56, verse number 77 to 80, which says that Quran is most honorable, a book well guarded, which none shall touch except those who are pure, except those who are clean. Here when the Holy Quran says none shall touch it, it does not mean physical touching. Any non-Muslim, they can easily take a Holy Quran and touch it and the Quran will be proved wrong. They can purchase a copy of the Holy Quran for 100 rupees or 200 rupees and they can touch it, the Quran will be proved wrong. When the Quran says none will be able to touch it, touch here does not mean physical touch, it means no one will be able to understand the Quran, will be able to derive the benefit of the Quran, will be able to assimilate the Quran, except those who are clean. Cleanliness does not mean body cleanliness, it means cleanliness besides of the body, it also means cleanliness of the heart, of the soul and of the mind. Touching the Quran without wudu also you can touch the Quran. It's not a fard, wudu should be there. You should not be najis. 
in ceremonial impurity. Cleanliness here means you should not be in ceremonial impurities. That's for the Muslim who believe in the Quran. Otherwise, even without wudu, you can touch the Quran. It's preferable to be in wudu. It's not a fard. But you cannot be in ceremonial impurity. We may pose the question that these non-Muslims, these kafirs, these mushrik, they are najis. How can they touch the Quran? See, the Holy Quran is not meant only for the Muslims. It was meant for the whole of humankind. It's mentioned in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 52. In Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 185. And Surah Al-Zumur, chapter 33, verse number 41. That the Quran was revealed for the whole of humankind. It was not only revealed for the Muslims or the Arabs, but for the whole of humankind. And a prophet, as I mentioned, was sent for the whole of humankind, not only for the Muslims. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds me responsible for giving the copy of the Holy Quran to the non-Muslims, I will be in good company. Because even a beloved prophet, he dictated letters in which verses of the Quran were mentioned. He gave to the non-Muslim kings. And one such letter is preserved in Turkey in the Koptaki Museum, which says, and it quotes one of the ayats of the Holy Quran, which says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Kul ya hilal kitab, O people of the book, Ta'ala wila kalmit in sawa'in, bainuna bainakum. Let's come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi. That we associate to partner with Him. Shayya wala yat sakhiza baazuna baazan arbaaban minnun illah. That we elect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fine tawallahu. If then they turn back. Fakulu shadu. Say we bear witness. We are not Muslimun. That we are Muslims bowing over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse of the Holy Quran was dictated by a beloved prophet and sent to non-Muslim kings. Some accepted Islam while the others stole that letter and trampled it beneath their feet. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds me responsible, I will be in the company of a beloved prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. When he can give the Holy Quran to the non-Muslims, why can't I give? People say, no, you should give only the translation, not the Arabic portion. I am asking, there are 14 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians. The Arabs... Arabic is a mother tongue, but they are Christians from birth. Means they were born in a Christian family. By birth they were Muslim, but they were born in a Christian family. Which translation of the Quran will you give to these Christian Arabs? You have to give the original Quran. So very well, you can give the Holy Quran to the non-Muslims. Even if they make a mistake of touching the Quran, it's a minor mistake. What we have to prevent them from doing is the biggest mistake of shirk. The Holy Quran says, Come to comment terms that between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi. That we associate no partners with Him. We are preventing the non muslim from doing the biggest sin of shirk. These small sins don't carry any weight in front of shirk. So this is the teaching of the Holy Quran and the teaching of a beloved Prophet. You can and you should give the Holy Quran to the non muslim so that they will have no excuse on the day of judgment saying that we did not get the message of Islam. If you have a non-Muslim neighbor and he's a mushrik, if you do not deliver the message to him and on the day of judgment, Allah will question him. Then why didn't you accept Islam? He said, I didn't get the message. Allah says it was your job to get the message. I gave it to you. You go to hell. Allah will pose you the question. Why didn't you deliver the message to your non-Muslim friend? Did you deliver the message? And if you say, I have not delivered the message, even you will follow him. Even you will go to Jahannam. I hope that answers the question. Well, brother, most welcome. First, we'll entertain the question from the mic. And inshallah, if time permits, we'll entertain the question from the slips. If there's any question on sister side, I believe they can write it on, the, on a slip and send it forward. How to impress upon the non-believer of the holy book, the holy prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who are themselves are not reading the holy scripture, they don't know what is Gita, they don't know what is Pranas, they accept the praise of the Lord Krishna by stealing a butter or uh, fluting the bugle or anything. How we have to be a mobile like you, to impress upon a non-believer to accept the holy Quran believes into the entire system of the universe, the faith of the people, and by ending it with Fatmul Muslim. If I hope if I am not wrong in my question. Do you understand? The question posed by the brother was 
that the Hindus, they don't themselves read the Gita. They don't know much about their own holy scriptures. They only know about Krishna, etc. So how do we do dawah with them? What do we have to tell them? That you have to ask them, as the Quran says, Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa'in bainana bainakum that come to come in terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi. That we associate to partner with him. The Holy Quran says, the best way of doing dawah is to say, Allah na'buda illallah. If they quote about Krishna, you have to say, Dear brother, my Hindu friend, where do you come to know about Krishna? So you will say, in Mahabharat, in Bhagavad Gita. Let him do the job. Bhagavad Gita is one of the holy scriptures of the Hindus. So you have to say, since you believe in Bhagavad Gita and you quote Krishna, Bhagavad Gita also says in chapter number 7, verse number 19 to 23, it says, All those who do idol worship, they are materialistic people. And those who do idol worship, they are materialistic people. They say, when they speak about Krishna and other lords, they say, we come to know about these things from the Vedas. So I gave a talk quoting from the Vedas, that if you say you believe in Lord Krishna because it's mentioned in Mahabharat, in Gita, you believe in certain Lord Ram because you believe in Ramayan, because you believe in the Vedas, etc. So if you believe in parts of Vedas, you have to believe as a whole. Your Vedas even prophesied the advent of a beloved prophet. And I gave quotations from Atharva Ved, from Rig Ved, from Sam Ved about the prophet of beloved prophet. You can even speak to them, Allah na'buda illallah, that we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi, that we associate no partner with him. You have to tell them, it's mentioned in your way, in the Rig Ved, chapter number 32, verse number 3. It says, na tasya pratima asti, of that God no image can be made. It's a Sanskrit quotation. In the same Yajur Ved, chapter number 40, verse number